Looking to share a bit of the national parks with someone in your life? Maybe that someone is you. Then check out our gay shop, featuring designs inspired by the sights, monuments, and majesty of America's national parks. And to celebrate Pride Month, the entire gay shop is 20% off to the end of June. Just use code PRIDE at checkout. But that's not all. Thadies and gentle thems, please welcome to the stage our sticker collection, including our gaze logo, our hike early and hike often design, and the iconic going to the sun road design, all in sticker format. Whether it's art for your wall or a sticker for your water bottle, you're sure to find something that sparks your love for the outdoors. Visit shop.gazeatthenationalparks.com to bring some of the national parks home with you. Today's episode of Gaze at the National Parks is sponsored by TrueFire.com, the planet's largest and most comprehensive selection of online guitar lessons, according to Guitar Player Magazine. TrueFire's interactive learning tools and massive library of over 50,000 video lessons help guitarists ignite their technical skills, harmonic knowledge, rhythm playing, and soloing. Over 2 million guitar players worldwide learn, practice, and play with TrueFire. Using TrueFire's desktop and mobile apps, guitarists work with multi-angle HD video lessons on any device, anytime, anywhere, and at their own pace. TrueFire's style-specific learning paths guide guitarists every step of the way. Use the assessment tools to find your starting point, then follow the lesson recommendations and track your progress as you work through your personalized TrueFire study plan. And TrueFire's educators are the best in the biz. From Grammy Award winners to world-renowned artists, TrueFire students have access to an unparalleled faculty of over 300 top-notch blues, rock, jazz, country, and acoustic guitar educators. Guitar players can progress faster with private one-on-one instruction, group lessons, multi-track video jams, live streams, song lessons, premium tracks, and so much more. With thousands of five-star reviews from amateur and pro players alike, you'll find yourself in good company with the world's most comprehensive guitar learning platform. So grab your guitar and ignite your musicality. Visit TrueFire.com and use code GAZE for your free 30-day all-access trial and 50% off your first purchase. That's TrueFire.com slash GAZE. And that's GAZE, G-A-Z-E. Hello and welcome to Gaze at the National Parks, the podcast. I'm Dusty. And I'm Mike. And welcome to our Season 4 Summit. If you're joining us for the first time, our Summit episodes succinctly summarize our season through four different lenses. Visitorship, environment, history, and hiking trails. Our Summit on Visitorship examines crowdedness, accessibility, location to civilization, and a whole manner of things you might be curious about when you are visiting one of these parks. Our History Summit examines the past and present issues going on in the park from many perspectives, but especially that of the indigenous people that originally called the Stolen Park Land their home. And our Hiking Trails Summit is all about the hikes we took throughout Season 4 in each of the parks we visited. This summit is all about environment, which in essence is the draw of the national parks, their natural splendor. Whether you're on the rocky shores of Maine, or the old-growth bottomland forest of Congaree, or dwarfed by the soaring majesty of sequoia trees in Sequoia National Park, chances are you are there to see the landscape and its majesty. And to help us out, this environmental summit is sort of like the love child of Captain Planet and Bill Nye the Science Guy. Were you like a big like Bill Nye and Huge. Captain Planet fan? Because that's where I feel like I lived. Were they were like ABC shows, I feel like. I can't remember... I don't what know what network, network they were, they were on, on, but I don't know what, I think Bill what played was them. PNC. PNC. <laughs> That's my bank. <laughs> <laughs> I think Bill was PBS. I feel like Bill Nye was PBS for I, sure. Sure. I yeah. honestly, I don't know. Yeah. But I watched so much Bill Nye. Mm. He always made science really fun. Right. And, and I, I always laugh at the like when he did the segments on like, you can do this at home, right? right? He's like, all you need is a cup, some water, and then some calcium bicarbonate. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? I'm like, well, I right. don't know where I'm going to get yeah. that. And then look, you make, can make a volcano, yeah. right? You go down to the calcium bicarbonate store. Right, exactly. Mm-hmm. But no, I loved Bill Nye. Yeah. I mean, I learned so much science from him. Right. I feel like it made it fun and accessible for everybody. I feel like it was also something that like, I think teachers definitely, like I remember even watching Bill Nye in like high school oh, or science. Absolutely. Because it was... I watched it all the time in very class. Very easy to like 
digest and to better understand processes. Especially when there was a Bill Nye episode that was so, you know, there were, so many of them were so specific. Right. And so they were, they were always great tools for teachers. Right. And I think another thing that made it like, such a draw is that there were kids that were doing a lot of the experiments and they were like, it wasn't all Bill focused. Right. It was like, we're going to have kids be the educators. It was like the original flipped classroom model, I feel yes. like. And so I think it was like, oh, these people are our peers. Let's listen to them. <laughs> right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. And Captain Planet, I loved because it was like superheroes well, who body. cared about the... <laughs> <laughs> Well, right. You know how I know you're gay. <laughs> Captain um, Planet's body. I And I, you know, liked that it was like a group of young people right. who cared about the world. I know. Who cared about the earth. I know. Wanted to take things, care of it. Things we need more we know, of these days. More of. But they're here. They we are have here. them. We, do. we have young people who care about the earth. Right. We do. And thankfully, those educational yet also entertaining programs, along with our impassioned science teachers and our love of the outdoors, have made our interest in the parks and the environment a top-notch issue for the both of us. That's right. If you've listened to past Summit episodes and a multitude of our trail mixes, we are extremely mindful of our fragile earth and its ecosystems, including public park land, and try to do our best to underscore these issues whenever we can in our episodes. And if you happen to be listening to my separate podcast, My Dark Corner, then you know that the environment and the many atrocities committed against it in a manner that isn't just hurting the earth, but our chances of survival as a species is a constant topic of conversation. Therefore, this year, our Summit and Environment will mainly be focused on the environment and wildlife of the national parks from Season 4, Yellowstone, Grand Teton, and Glacier, and how the impact of climate change is altering the course of these parks' futures. I do have to interject here and make sure to tell our listeners who will absolutely go searching for your podcast (laughs) called My Dark Corner that Mike was making a joke. (laughs) However... Who knows? Maybe Mike will finally start his solo podcast Mm -hmm. called My Dark Corner. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to start one called My Bright Corner. I I don't know. Before we jump into the sadness, we would like to acknowledge that while hiking in Yellowstone National Park, we were on the traditional and stolen land of the Eastern Shoshone, Crow, Cheyenne, and many other indigenous peoples. While we were hiking in Grand Teton National Park, we were on the traditional and stolen land of the Eastern Shoshone, Shoshone Bannock, and Cheyenne people. And while hiking in Glacier National Park, we were on the traditional and stolen land of the Blackfeet and the Tanaha people. Let's take some time and talk about how the national parks as a whole are being affected by climate change. To help us get started, we'll turn to our friends at the National Parks Conservation Association, or NPCA, as we oftentimes do, to get a better sense of the broad issues. So, Dusty, there are 10 issues that the NPCA underscores as climate-fueled issues that face the national parks. Care to take a guess on what some of those might be? I would say probably, like, increase in visitorship. Is that one? Am I in the right ballpark? So I guess I need a ballpark. Give sure. Ballpark. Yes, that's... it's. Well, I'll say that one of them is actually ch- it's changes to visitorship and recreation. So it's okay. like that's going to be an impact f- okay. of climate change on the national parks. What are some other things that will be an impact on the parks um, that's climate related? I mean, obviously, increase in like heat. Right. Yep. That's got to be one of them. Heat, increase in heat. It would be related to drought and, and drought water and water yep. availability. Um Animal population. Exactly. Wildlife habitation is definitely something that's also going to be an effect. That includes like, you know, the actual physical space where Mm -hmm. they live and also the amount of those animals that are there. And their ability to survive and thrive in those spaces. Right. Yep. I would say increase of natural disasters. Sister, you're getting them all. Keep going. Um, (laughs) How many was that? Five? That was like four, I think. Four. Okay, four. Oh, I'm going to say like, I feel like legislation acts as like a barrier to... Because they can't protect certain things or get some things, you know, certain protections, Mm. whether it be land, whether it be animals, whether it be whatever it is that causes an issue. Okay. Maybe. Sure. Um, Let's see what else. Yeah, take Um, another guess or two and then I'll review. uh, Carbon inside of parks. Okay. Oh, construction and around the parks. Okay. That's so those are one. those are some pretty good guesses, and you actually got a lot of them. Um, the issues that are mainly underscored by the NPCA include rising sea levels, fire, harm to wildlife, extreme weather damage, drought and water availability, loss of snow and ice, changing landscapes, and invasive species. 
as well as these less directly climate impactful issues on the natural landscape, but more so on the human factor of the parks, which include damage to historical and cultural spaces and alterations to recreation and visitation patterns. So okay. what surprised you about that list? Honestly, none, none of this is surprising yeah. to me. Yeah. Um, this is stuff that is all... It all tracks, right? It all tracks. In a terrifying way. <laughs> Especially the, of course, the loss of snow and ice and what right. like a resource snow right. and ice is. Right. So many of those issues that I just listed, that MPCA listed, are related to water. And, yeah, and changes so in many precipitation. I think that is going to be a thing that really is going to be trouble for more than just the national parks in the future. Um, yeah. Yeah. What areas of the country do you think are most vulnerable or what park spaces might you feel be at a higher risk than others when it comes to impacts of climate change and the alteration of landscapes? What do you think? I would say areas that are near water where there are rising sea levels. Mm-hmm probably areas that are um, less likely to get rain. Mm -hmm. I would say like closer to shoreline, but as we can see with what's happening in Yellowstone, you don't have to be closer to shoreline to feel the effects of like natural disaster. Right. And we'll talk about Yellowstone in a bit, but no, you're, you're not wrong about that, but the largest impacts would definitely be on the Southwest and Alaska. They have seen and will likely continue to see some of the biggest impacts when it comes to the changing climate of the Earth. If you've been reading the news and paying attention to the climate, the Southwest is one of the most greatly impacted areas when it comes to climate change, as temperatures are soaring in these regions and water is becoming more and more scarce. Both Lake Powell and Lake Mead, the two largest reservoirs in the United States, are drying up, which have dire impacts on not only these spaces alone, but also large areas of the Southwest. Lake Mead is important to over 20 million people individually, as well as large swaths of farmland throughout California, Nevada, and Arizona. National parks as spaces were and still are preserved because of their natural splendor. And much of their splendor is due to the fact that many of these parks are in spaces that already are in the extremes when it comes to weather and climate. Therefore, shifts to the climate globally have far-reaching impact on these spaces in extreme. According to a Washington Post article from 2018 titled... Climate change is destroying our national parks at an alarming rate, study finds. Data, culled from 1895 to 2010, showed that temperatures rose in parklands twice as much as the rest of the country, while precipitation also fell drastically. That precipitation doesn't just mean rain either, as parks in Alaska, which make up 63% of the national park land in the United States, have, like many northern alpine parks, dependent on snow, also seen a dramatic drop in snowfall. The melting snow in these spaces and lack of traditional precipitation cause the darker surfaces of the earth to be revealed, which absorb more heat, creating a cycle that adds more harm than good. While the parks of Alaska and the American Southwest are seeing some of the greatest impact, let's briefly examine other parks and spaces and the impact of the items listed by the MPCA as climate-related issues impacting the parks, but also much of the world at large. First step, rising sea levels, extreme weather damage, and damage to historical and cultural spaces. We grouped these three together because they most certainly connect. Rising sea levels is something that coastal residents the world over are going to have to tackle at some point before the end of the century. Models predict that sea levels may rise between seven inches and six and a half feet in different areas of the country by the end of the century. Parks like Everglades, Biscayne, Dry Tortugas, Acadia, American Samoa, Gateway National Recreation Area, Channel Islands, and even the National Mall will feel the effects of sea level rise and may even cease to exist or cease to exist in their current state because of it. Not only that, but many of these park spaces, especially on the East Coast and Gulf Coast of the United States, are a major risk for extreme weather damage damage brought on by powerful storms and hurricanes. With warmer rising oceans, the impacts of these storms will only increase. Think about other monuments and park sites in coastal cities and the damage that may be extolled as the climate crisis worsens. Fire is a major risk, especially in the Southwest as the climate becomes hotter and drier. Again, you'd have to be living under a rock to not have heard about the massive wildfires that have been plaguing the country. And if you're paying attention to world news, 
the world as well. The impact of wildfire is exacerbated because the season has become much longer than it was in the past because summers are much hotter and summer temperatures stretch longer. Parks that have faced this threat and will imminently face it again include Yellowstone, Yosemite, Sequoia, Kings Canyon, and Glacier, among others. And while fire is good for the life cycle of a forest, as we have discussed before, out-of-control wildfires like these are dangerous and destructive and only add to the climate crisis via the release of massive amounts of carbon into the atmosphere. Harm to wildlife is another major impact. Shifting climate not only impacts the homes of wildlife, but also affects their food sources. Remove one piece of the ecosystem puzzle and you're likely to have a system that either collapses or that alters in a way that throws the whole system out of balance. Just like when wolves were removed from Yellowstone. Without an apex predator to cull elk within the park, the elk altered too much of the ecosystem. With the reintroduction of wolves, the ecosystem rebalanced itself. Perhaps if we're lucky, the $1.39 billion Recovering America's Wildlife Act of 2022 can help to address some of these coming issues related to wildlife. However, the long and short of it is, these natural spaces, home to thousands of species, are in danger, and therefore, so are the residents, the flora and fauna. Drought and water availability and loss of snow and ice are two impacts that also very much go together and could also very much be connected to fire damage. As snowpacks lessen from season to season and higher, more intense temperatures start earlier and earlier, meltwater streams and estuaries dry up faster in the season. While these water sources are important to wildlife and keeping the park lush and verdant, they also feed communities and help prevent damage from wildfire. Lack of precipitation, as discussed earlier, directly contributes to this impact. This will also greatly impact visitation and recreation habits, as some of these spaces may be less welcoming in the coming decades. And last but not least, changing landscapes and invasive species. Landscapes are constantly changing from season to season and year to year, but the changes to these landscapes, especially those iconic in nature, have been hastened by climate change. Alaska and the parklands there are an excellent example of how the change of climate has impacted not only the environment, but also the wildlife and the lives of individuals who call the space home. Glacier National Park, too, has seen a dramatic loss of their glaciers, for which the park has been named. While not gone yet, as once predicted, the shifts in climate are having an immense impact. Invasive species like bark beetles and tree-borne diseases are choking the forests and woodlands of the national parks and robbing the land of trees, while also hastening the climate crisis. That being said, some parks have taken proactive stances regarding their landscapes and combating issues related to invasive species. With the climate soaring and with everything environmental being connected, larger action is certainly necessary and warranted in order to affect change and alter the future for the better. So how are we feeling out there? <sighs> well, I mean, none of this is new information for no, me. No, no. But when it's yeah, all in your face, all, at all once, in your face, all great. at once. I mean, it's uh, as we've talked about, it's all connected. Mm-hmm. I mean, more and more and more and more do I feel um, challenged to find hope. And I know it's there. This weekend is particularly hard regarding climate. It's like the only way forward is giant collective action. Right. And it's really disheartening when collective action seems so out like, of reach. Out of reach yeah. entirely. Yeah. I don't remember the last time we had like true collective action. Mm-hmm. That's really hard. That's really tough. I know that we have to think globally and act locally. Those are things that we can do. We can't be disheartened or feel like our contribution to our our local action is not helping. Right. Because, well, no, it may not be changing the course of everything all at once. It is doing something. It is helping in a way. And it's ne- necessary. Yeah. That's what I'm reminded of right now. What about you? Yeah, I mean, you know that I live in the darkness most days. It's, uh, or I guess I live in maybe a realist view of what's happening. Realist to pessimist. That's sort of my, um, <laughs> I'm, my star sign's and realist and my rising sign is pessimist. <laughs> I'm on the realist to optimist. Right. Yeah, um, so we balance each other. We, we do. It seems to me that, yes, collective action is needed. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, I fear that most of what will happen is going to be reactive and less proactive. I feel like that is 20% proactive, 80% reactive Mm. to the way that 
this crisis is being handled. And you can't work with reactive policies. You have to be proactive here because we're already behind the eight ball or in front of it. I can never remember, you know, sure. we're already behind here. Yeah. So you have to be aggressively proactive as opposed to scrambling when everything has fallen to shit and then be like, oh, well, we're going to do all these policies now. It's going to be too late at that point. That's how I'm feeling. Mm-hmm. There's my rising pessimist. <laughs> right. Yeah. But we have to problem solve. Mm-hmm. We cannot just be open vessels mm-hmm. for for victimhood. Mm-hmm. We have to we have to problem solve. That to me is acting locally. Mm-hmm. What's in my reach right now that I can do something mm-hmm. about, um, and it will it will mm-hmm. have a greater impact. Yeah. But let's take a break for a moment and um, and add some joy. <laughs> add some joy. No one has a business like yours with all its strengths and challenges. To succeed, you need a hiring partner that adapts to your needs. You need Indeed. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Instead of spending hours on multiple job sites searching for candidates with the right skills, Indeed's a powerful hiring partner that can help you do it all. Find great talent faster through time-saving tools like Indeed Instant Match, assessments, and virtual interviews. With Instant Match over over 80% of employers can get quality candidates whose resume on Indeed matches their job description the moment they sponsor a job, according to Indeed Data US. One of the things that I love about Indeed is that it makes hiring all in one place so easy because Indeed has such great talent. In fact, three out of four US online job seekers search for jobs on Indeed each month, according to Comscore. And when you sponsor an Indeed post in the US, you're three times more likely to get a hire, according to Indeed Data. Even Even better, Indeed's the only job site where you only pay for applications that meet your must-have requirements. Indeed is an unbelievably powerful hiring partner delivering four times more hires than all other job sites combined, according to Talent Nest 2019. The right candidate is doing everything they can do to find you. And if you use Indeed, you can be sure you're doing everything you can to find them too. So join more than 3 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at indeed.com slash gaze. Offer good for a limited time. Claim your $75 credit right now at indeed.com slash gaze. And that's G-A-Z-E. That's indeed.com slash gaze. Terms and conditions apply. Pay per qualified applicant not available for all users. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Reunion is a beautiful island filled with rich culture, fantastic food, incredible beaches, and the world's deadliest shark attacks. It all started in 2011 when sharks on Reunion just started biting people, way more than ever before, and with lunatic violence. The Reunion Island shark crisis became one of the most extreme shark attack epidemics in recorded history. How will the locals, the government, and the business owners navigate this complicated situation? This season of Reunion, Shark Attacks in Paradise will tell the remarkable stories of the people who lived through these attacks and how the island is reacting to the uptake of sharks in the water. So why is this happening? And how has this complicated problem seeped into the culture of the island? Join host, pro surfer, and best-selling author Dan Duane on his trip to Reunion Island as he seeks to get answers. Listen to Reunion, Shark Attacks in Paradise on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts or subscribe to binge all episodes now. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage our environmental summit queen on a mission. On a mission. Mm-hmm. I love this name. Mm-hmm. On a mission. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like she is a superhero queen. Yeah. She's Captain Planet's She is the captain. Ooh. Maybe she can get me his number. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Yeah. She's the new. Okay. We're out there. We're giving you, we're giving it to you. We're just giving it to you for free, everybody. <laughs> um, whoever is the creator of Captain Planet, right. like make the updated, you yeah. know, derivative piece of copyright material called On a Mission. Yeah. And she's the right. she's like Carmen San Diego, but for good. But for good. But, for but good. I think she's still mysterious. Yeah. She's like mysterious and doing a lot behind the scenes that people don't see. Yeah. And it's just sort of like you you see the results yeah. 
of her work. Yeah. And um, she's not the main character. It's somebody trying to figure out where to find on a mission. Right. And, like, figure yeah. out where they can. She's leaving clues for how you can fix a crisis. Exactly. There you go. That's it's on not a mission. Her, it's not her job. This is like the teachable moment. It's like, here's how you do it. And it's, it's on you. And I feel like at the end of the series, like this person has gone on this like journey and the they, whole time. they come face to face with on a mission and it's just a mirror. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't what I was going for, but that's funny. No, I was going to say she, uh, di- or they discovered that on a mission is many, 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 many people. Mm. And it's all of the people that they've met along the way. Got it. I like that. Gosh, there's I know. some hope. I need to write that book. Yeah. Let's write that book on Let's a mission. Write that book. So what's right. her merch? Does she have any? Like it can't be something made of plastic. No. No. But no. I feel like it could be like, I mean, I feel like maybe Cloud Paper is her sponsor. Oh, I like Something this. like that. Yes. Okay. Former right. sponsor of ours. Yeah. But something like that along yeah. those lines. I do think she lip syncs to The Greatest Love of All and We Don't Need Another Hero Thunderdome. Oh, like a Whitney Tina mashup. Oh, I'll take it. I believe the children <laughs> are a future. I like this. I like this. Yeah. Yeah. I'm into this. Mm-hmm. Great. On a mission. On a mission. We so. might have created a children's book series. I'm not mad about and it. And you heard it here first, yeah. everybody. <laughs> so so we Thades, get started on yeah. that. So Thades and General Thems, please welcome to the stage, On a Mission. So how do these issues play out into the parks that we've visited this season of the show? And what plans, if any, does park management have to mitigate some of the larger issues that surround climate change in their spaces? Along with the goal to phase out single-use plastic in the national park spaces by 2032, the NPS is keenly aware of and working to address climate change in the spaces they have charge over. NPS is also working with the Clean Friendly Parks Program, or CFP. Together, the two aim to, quote, provide national parks with comprehensive support to address climate change within broad park boundaries and surrounding communities, end quote. Some of the goals of the CFP include the, quote, measure park-based greenhouse gas emissions, or GHG, to, quote, educate staff, partners, stakeholders, and the public about climate change and demonstrate ways individuals and groups can take action to address the issue, and to, quote, assist parks in developing strategies and specific actions to address sustainability challenges, reduce GHG emissions, and anticipate the impacts of climate change on park resources. NPS has also published literature on their park websites related to climate change and climate change specific issues in each of these spaces. Turning our attention to the parks of season four, Yellowstone, Grand Teton, and Glacier, we can examine what issues are climate specific and how they're being addressed in these spaces. It's hard to ignore the elephant in the room when it comes to Yellowstone National Park. Most recently, in the summer of 2022, Yellowstone and the surrounding region experienced a -a once-in-a-500-year flood that devastated the communities surrounding and adjacent to the parkland. The combination of large amounts of rain and heavy snow melt from a cool and snowy spring sent rivers bounding from their banks, washed away and eroded roadways and bridges, and flooded and destroyed buildings, homes, and people's livelihoods. The combination of snow melt and rain had the Yellowstone River crest at 14 feet two and a half feet higher than previously recorded in 1918. The amount of water flowing the Yellowstone River over the four days between June 11th and June 15th was equivalent to 70 billion gallons. The extreme weather event will have an immense impact on the park for years to come as infrastructure is rebuilt and hopefully done so in a way to address climate change. Since science is based in evidence, here are some evidentiary findings that show the impact of the shifting climate on Yellowstone National Park. Temperatures are higher than they were 50 years ago, nighttime temperatures increasing more rapidly than those of the daytime. There are fewer days below freezing and fewer days with snow on the ground than there were in the 1960s, and the growing season has increased by about 30 days in some parts of the park. These changes will ultimately impact the makeup of the park Park's ecosystem, both flora and fauna, the timing of snow melt, which not only affects the parkland, but people downstream, and the length and intensity of fire season. Regarding the flora and fauna in the park, aspen trees, welcome to the stage, aspen tree, aspen trees and white bark pine may find it harder to maintain at lower, now drier elevations. Wolverine populations may decrease with the decrease of deep snowpacks. High water levels in Yellowstone Lake 
impact pelican nesting affected by snowmelt, and elk and pronghorn may need to alter their migration routes over time, an issue related to the growing period and stream water flow. Yellowstone is working to do its part to mitigate impact on the landscape and the climate overall while also working to fold in more sustainability. Solar panels have been implemented within the park at visitor centers and historic spaces, and hydroelectricity has found a footing as well. Geothermal energy isn't being explored, however, as there is concern it may impact the park's hydrothermal features. Water usage and conservation are carefully being considered for residents and guests alike through updated features which better mitigate water use. Fuel conservation, electric vehicles for park staff, and rideshare programs are all initiatives that the park has started to allow for conservancy along with the addition of charging stations for electric vehicles for guests. Yellowstone seems keenly aware of the issues it faces and how to best assess for the future. By working to phase out past practices that were harmful and introduce best practices for the environment at large, not just Yellowstone, it seems as though the park is headed in a worthwhile direction. Turning our attention to Grand Teton National Park, Yellowstone's closest neighbor. Many issues relating to climate change are shared between these two parks as they are ostensibly the same ecosystem, or if not the same, at least sisters. Some larger issues at play relate to changing landscapes, invasive species, and fire. A major shift in the ecosystem of the Tetons is the earlier growing season, or the earlier blooming of plants and flowers. This is tied directly to snowmelt and warmer temperatures earlier in the season. In some parts of the parks, flowers and plants are waking up a full two weeks to two and a half weeks early, as the spring melt is occurring about three weeks earlier than it once did in the 1970s. Blooms, flowering, and fruiting at traditional intervals play a large part onto the fauna within the park's boundaries and beyond. In a similar and related fashion, early melts contribute to less water for plants and animals, and therefore drier summers and falls, which may not only create crisis when it comes to food and vegetation for wildlife, but also have a hand in relation to fires and fire management. Speaking of fires... Grand Teton, Yellowstone, and Glacier National Parks are all parks identified as having greater risks for fires due to climate change. Along with warmer, prolonged summer seasons and drier landscapes, a lack of precipitation is and can be a major cause to fire within the national parks. While fire can wreak devastation, it can also help to generate life, as is the case with a variety of trees found within Grand Tetons, including aspen and lodgepole pines. However, even these seedlings, born from fire, have their limits as cooler, damper climates they were used to thriving in become less available to warmer, drier climates. But fire isn't the only cause for concern when it comes to the trees of Grand Tetons National Park, as mountain bark beetles, blister rust, and changing climate conditions wreak havoc as well. We covered bark beetles in an earlier trail mix episode this season, but suffice it to say, they weaken and make vulnerable a tree through their habits just below the bark. Blister rust is a non-native tree disease which is causing just as much harm to white pines within the park as much as it is in at least 38 states. And as usual, and in line with this episode, much of this relates to climate change and higher temperatures that prevent the dieback of these invasive species and diseases as cooler temperatures and colder, longer winters once had. Commonality between these two parks, while different in landscape but similar in ecosystems, help to underscore the interconnectedness of not only these spaces, but the climate crisis at hand. While not a directly adjacent park, Glacier National Park is still within the Rocky Mountain Range and faces many of the same issues in one way or another. We've already mentioned it several times this episode, but it's worth mentioning again. Wildfire is a major issue facing Glacier National Park. While fire in some way has always been a part of the life cycle of Glacier National Park or any forest or parkland, some can be particularly destructive. Some more recent fires that have scorched portions of the park include Reynolds Creek Fire in 2015, Sprague Fire in 2017, and the Howe Ridge Fire in 2018. Having walked through areas that were impacted by fire within the park, it's clear how destructive it can be. Aside from the Sayi Pass Trail near Sunriff Gorge, we also experienced a fire die back in the Two Medicine area as we hiked to Scenic Point. The ghostly remnants of trees are a definitive reminder of what once was and what was lost. While fire is certainly an issue, Glacier National Park is probably one of the main parks that people speak of when it comes to changing landscapes. That's because Glacier National Park is losing its iconic glaciers for which the park was named. This is not a unique problem to Glacier or to the national parks of the United States, but rather the world over. Additional parks that are suffering loss of glaciers include Gates of the Arctic, Mount Rainier, and Grand Teton, among others. 
To a casual observer, visiting these spaces one time may not sound alarm bells, which is, of course, unless they happen to have had photographic evidence of glacier loss in front of them. But to scientists and lifelong residents of the park, like our friend Becky Lomax, the loss is devastating and alarming. Of the 30-plus glaciers within the park, from 1966 to 2015, there was a 50% ice loss. While thinner, wider glaciers seem to experience the largest amount of ice loss, the thicker, smaller glaciers also experience loss as well. While you can hear more about glaciers in our trail mix from the season titled Trail Mix, The Science of Glaciers, there are some things worth noting when it comes to glacier loss. On a global level, glacier loss will contribute to sea level rise and will alter the surface energy balance of the Earth as well as ocean current circulation. On a regional level, glacier loss will impact water availability for drinking, agriculture, fisheries, and recreation, which in turn has a negative impact on local economies as tourism will be impacted as well. Glacier loss will also contribute to changing landscapes of parks and water sources for plants and animals within the parks and the regions the meltwater reaches. All of this adds up to the higher likelihood of fire and devastation, further altering the landscape. As the climate continues to warm, Glacier, like many other western parks, will continue to see hotter summer days more frequently. A loss of visibility in harmful breathing conditions due to wildfires, more disease-spreading insects like ticks and mosquitoes, and for residents of the areas near the park, issues related to mental health, as climate alterations have been shown to impact cognitive functioning. If all of this seems a little bleak, that's because it is. Why sugarcoat it? Hope is a beautiful thing. But a fool's hope is negligent. While yes, there are measures that can be put in place to tackle these issues and prevent the worst parts of climate change the world over, politicians are less proactive and more reactive. Just look at the pandemic. And unfortunately, we can't continue to run at the pace we currently are, especially with the blinders on. While we as individuals can take steps to be better climate citizens, bleakly, governments and corporations, two entities known for having the best interest of the little guy at heart, have a lot of work to do. We can put pressure, we can call, and we can donate all we want. And yes, change will happen. But we can't afford to do things incrementally anymore. We must act seismically. We must shake the earth and its people out of their stupor before reaction is all we have left. And that's a path we shouldn't be looking forward to walking. The sources for this summit episode include the National Park Conservation Association, the National Park Service, the United States Geological Survey, the Washington Post article, Climate change is destroying our national parks at an alarming rate, study finds by Alex Horton, and the Sierra Club article, How Climate Change Could Destroy Our National Parks by Melanie Haken. So as bleak as this episode is, and as pessimistic as I sound, I always have optimism on my side to buoy me up, and that optimism is in my friend Dusty Ballard. And I do what I can. <laughs> the world is a dark place at the moment um, for many reasons. The climate is definitely one of them. Rights of people, human rights. Yeah or another um decency decency human respect yeah we don't love to leave things on a a a dour note so we have written a game for this episode Mm -hmm. that perhaps you can uh you know take in as some joy Mm -hmm. uh that's um always our intention if we want to present the the darkness of reality we also want to present and offer some uh, joy along with it. So um, take this game as as that. Okay, Mike, so what game are we playing? So this game is called Disaster. Okay. (laughs) A very aptly named game. Great. I'm going to take the 10 action items or the 10 items that the MPCA kind of outlined would be an impact from climate change. And I'm going to um, give you a clue that's based in a movie that somehow relates to those action items. Okay. You're just going to need to name the movie. You don't need to name that item that's going to be a climate change, effect, like an effect. Yeah. But I will we'll talk about it after and Great. how it relates. Okay. But okay. I'm sure you'll be able to figure out w- how it relates. Great. Does it make sense? Okay. Mm-hmm. So the first one, there's 10. So in this 1990s love story that launched a thousand ships and sank just one really big one, These characters must escape the rising ocean waters only to float away on a piece of detritus, which definitely had space for two, yet only one managed to survive. Okay. I... Titanic. Yeah, Titanic. Yeah, okay. The movie. And this well, is, you said it was the ship that launched, or the face that launched a thousand ships. I said the story that launched a thousand ships, but sank oh. at least one really big one. <laughs> I see. Right. Um, I was yes, like, and this, were, are, 
we talking about Troy and no, Helen? No, no. Because you were right. She is the face that launched right. a thousand. You were right. Shows. No, 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 no. If in, you read the, re- if you listened to the rest, of the I listened to the rest. Well, okay, because great. Jack could have survived on that board. Oh, the science has been the proven. Science has been proven. Science has proven it. Rose was selfish. Was it, or <laughs> did he just not ask for what he needed? That's true. That's okay. There's that too. There is that too. That all relates to rising ocean. Sure. Does that make sense? Yeah. Great. Yeah. For the second, there's a fire sale says Tobias Funke dramatically, repeatedly, and yet in an overacted tone, leading to a disaster of an audition. Him sobbing in the shower in his cut-off jeans. Hey, he's a never-nude. In this three-season family comedy from the early aughts that Netflix eventually picked up for two additional seasons. What is Arrested Development? That's correct. And this all relates to fire. Fire. National parks. Yeah. So you can hopefully see where I'm headed here. I do. This entire movie could be about extreme weather damage as... George Clooney, Mark Wahlberg, and John C. Riley fight for their lives on a fishing boat off the New England coast. What is the perfect storm? That's correct. And this is all about extreme weather damage. Yeah. Okay. This early aughts film isn't just about a single mom and her hard work as a paralegal, but how she fought for a small California community after a major utility poisoned their water and attempted to cover it up. You know what I don't understand is that you have all of these files here just under your nose. I want to know how you sleep at night. Miss Sanchez. <laughs> <laughs> or how much your uterus costs. Oh, no, yeah. that's, no, that's, that's different. Later. That's, um, yeah. No, see, that pisses me off. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> these people aren't dreaming about, oh no, I'm just, I have to pull it up now. Because it's, <laughs> what is Aaron Brockovich? Right, you're right. Hold on. But you're going to dramatically give us some joy here. Oh, see, now that pisses me off. First of all, since the demur, we now have more than 400 plaintiffs. And let's be honest, we all know there's more out there. Now, they may not be the most sophisticated people, but they do know how to divide. And $20 million isn't shit when it's split between them. And second of all, these people don't dream of being rich. They dream of being able to watch their kids swim in a pool without worrying that they'll have to have a hysterectomy at the age of 20. Like Rosa Diaz a client of ours, or have their spine deteriorate, like Stan Bloom, another client of ours. So before you come back here with another lame-ass offer, I want you to think real hard about how much your spine is worth, Mr. Buddha, or what you'd expect someone to pay for your uterus, Miss Sanchez. Then take out your calculator and multiply that number by 100. Anything less than that is a waste of our time. There you go. You got it. Oh, and we had that water brought in special for you. Mm-hmm. It's from Will and Hinckley. Mm-hmm. All day, every day. All day, every day. Uh, Aaron, be our champion. I feel like I'm probably going to go watch that movie later. Great. All right, next. Um, While this movie is ultimately a sisterly drama that's also about finding yourself, it involves a kingdom trapped in ice loosely based on The Snow Queen by Hans Christian Andersen that can only be thawed through the power of love. What is Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants? <laughs> um, what is Frozen? That's right. That's <laughs> correct. And that's all about snow and ice loss. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. All right. Seismic shifts in the landscape of this long ago Earth, coupled with the main character's mother sacrificing herself to save him and another character from Sharp Tooth, are the inciting incident that leads to a Jurassic adventure to get to the Great Valley, a land of peace and tranquility in this animated 80s film. What is the land before time? That's correct. That is all about shifting landscapes. Shifting landscapes. Mm-hmm. This late 90s high school movie is less about boy meets girl as it is boy meets alien as the entire school, starting with the professional staff, is one by one taken over by an invading alien species. This is one of your favorite movies. Mm-hmm. What is The Faculty? That's correct. And that's all B. about B. B. New Earth. <laughs> that's right. B.B. New Earth. In this potential earth ender of a film, several world sites are completely damaged or destroyed by falling debris, including Grand Central Station, parts of Paris, and the city of Shanghai. Thanks to some space cowboys, the earth limps on to turn another day. What is it's the day after tomorrow? No. What is Men in Black? No. I don't know. What is Armageddon? I've not seen it. Oh, okay. I never well, saw that's it. That's fine. It's not like you're, it's a Michael Bay film. You're not missing much. So, all right. So Armageddon. Yeah. Great. And that's I all know about the song. damage to um, cultural and historic. Yeah, yep. of course. Okay. While a family road trip seems like a great idea, driving across country can often have its pitfalls, especially when trying to visit a closed for renovations theme park like Wally World. 
what is vacation? What is National, well, National Lampoon's, Lampoon's vacation. vacation? Chevy Chase. And that's all about um, declining visitorship or altered visitorship. Ah, and the last see. clue is this. This is the hard one. While the central theme of this Studio Ghibli film, the studio that produced such films as Spirited Away and Howl's Moving Castle, is very much so the environment. The addition of talking animals and animal gods and the desecration of their forest home by humans, specifically Lady Hiboshi of Irontown, really makes this film about wildlife and the delicate balance of their homes in nature. Huh. This is one of my favorite movies. Is it Kiki's Delivery Service? It's not Kiki's Delivery Service. But good for you. You got, you got there, girl, with that Ghibli. That's the same co- same studio. Same studio. Yeah. Then it's another. What is Princess Mononoke? Yes. Yes. Look I got you. There, there you Boom. go. Boom. Shout out to Dave and Mariella who uh, created um, all of the music for our show. That is how I remember it mm-hmm. because they also love that movie. It's wonderful. And in a uh, Halloween from 2019, I remember this. They went as characters from Princess mm-hmm. Mononoke. Mm-hmm. Something I've never seen and need to watch. It's great. I would love it. I know. This has been our Season 4 Summit by Gaze at the National Parks, the podcast. And we're here to remind you to hike early and hike often, and that adventure is always out there. Gaze at the National Parks was created and is hosted by us, Dustin Ballard, and Michael Ryan. To see images from this episode, follow our Instagram at Gaze at the National Parks. To contact us, email us at Gaze at the National Parks at gmail.com. And to find out more about the parks visited on this show, visit our website, Gaze at the National Parks.com. That's Gaze, G A Z E. All original artwork featured on Instagram, on our website, and in the Gaze Shop is by me, Michael Ryan. All original music was written by Dave Seaman and performed by Dave Seaman, Mariella Klinger, and Sean Sklios. Our music producer is Skylar Fortgang. This episode was edited by me, Dustin Ballard. We would also like to acknowledge while recording this episode, we were on the traditional and stolen lands of the Lenape people, also known as Middlesex County, New Jersey. (laughs) 